Hi students, welcome to the notes on isotopes. Please turn to the appropriate page in your notebook and let's go ahead and get started. Remember, this is a video. At any point, you can pause the video to catch up on the notes. And I recommend you do so if you feel like you're falling a little bit behind or you can rewind to review things or even fast forward if you feel like you understand it very well. Let's start with the essential question. What are isotopes? Please write this in colored ink at the top of your page. You might also want to take the opportunity to set up your notebook as in the KCQ style, the modified Cornell style of notes. Key terms. At the end of the notes, make sure you're recording the key terms that we've been talking about, those vocab terms. Anything that you can connect to the prior things we've done in class uh, or in, even things in your life, you can write down here. And then finally, any questions you may have that you're confused about, or if you're not confused, you feel like you get it all, write a test question that is a good review for the upcoming test. Let's start with a writing prompt. I'm going to ask you a question. How many protons, neutrons, and electrons does fluorine have? Please take a moment to stop the video, to pause the video, and try to answer this question yourself. Did you pause it? All right, let's keep going. To answer this question, let's start with the number of protons. This number right here is called the atomic number. It represents the identity of the atom or fluorine, which also is Coincidentally, the number of protons, or I guess non-coincidentally, it is the number of protons. All right, how about the number of neutrons? Well, this number down here will be helpful with for us for that one. This number, and we're going to round it to 19, represents the mass of an atom. If we look at an atom like this one, and this is not fluorine, it's just a general atom, the nucleus or the center of the atom represents all of the atom's mass. Now, in that nucleus is protons and neutrons, so that's where the mass comes from. Well, we just learned that the mass equals 19, and we know that 9 of that 19 is protons. So the leftovers must be neutrons, i.e. 10. There are 10 neutrons in fluorine. Electrons are the last one. Now, we haven't talked too much about electrons, but for now, just realize that electrons are going to be the same as protons for a neutral atom. Now, what we mean by neutral is charge has been canceled out. Protons have a positive charge. There are nine of them. So there's a positive nine charge in fluorine. Neutrons are neutral. They don't represent charge. So we can kind of ignore them when it comes to charge. So if there's positive nine charge, we have to cancel that out with the electrons, which are, we gotta have, which are negatively charged. So we need to have nine of them as well. All right, in this notes, note taking um, right now, in this note taking video, we're gonna talk about and focus on the role of neutrons. Neutrons act like glue to stabilize the protons in the nucleus. Now, why do they need to do that? Well, protons are positively charged. All of them are. They don't wanna be near each other. When positive meets positive, like charges repel each other. Think of taking two of the same sides of a magnet and trying to stick it together. Usually it repels. So neutrons, because they do not contribute to charge, they can get in there, they can hug those protons together and stabilize them in that nucleus. Now we've talked about a few of these things before. Protons represent the identity. And now we know that neutrons stabilize the atom. So we're gonna use that, I'm gonna use that term quite often. The stabilizing agent of an atom is the neutrons. Now electrons don't stabilize the atom, they neutralize the atom. So protons are identity, neutrons stabilize the nucleus, the electrons neutralize them, i.e. they cancel the charge out. And we will talk more about electrons on a different day. All right, so we've done a FET simulation before. It's called building an atom, and I highly recommend you go play with it at some point. You can actually put in electrons, protons, and neutrons and see what they do. Um, so here's an example of that simulation. I just took a few screenshots. Here are three different lithium atoms with different numbers of neutrons. Notice all of them have the same protons. This one has three protons, three protons, three protons. They're all lithium atoms because that's the identity. But notice that this one has three neutrons and it's stable. This one has four neutrons and it's still stable. Now this one has five neutrons and it becomes unstable. The idea behind this is atoms can have different numbers of neutrons. Even atoms can have different numbers of neutrons and still be stable. But there are lithiums out there that are have five neutrons that are unstable. So you can have both stable and unstable lithium atoms or atoms in general. It doesn't really matter. Just realize that there's more than one possibility of an atom to exist with different numbers of neutrons. This leads us to the definition of isotopes, which is kind of the key point of these slides. Atoms that are the same element 
kind of like lithium, lithium, lithium. They are that way because they have the same number of protons, but with different numbers of neutrons are known as isotopes. So here's another example. Here we have three carbon atoms. Carbon 12, that's the mass, the number of protons and neutrons. Here we have carbon 13 with a mass of protons and neutrons. So notice carbon 12 has six protons, and you might not be able to see it, but it says six neutrons. Carbon 13 has six protons and seven neutrons, and carbon 14 has six protons and eight neutrons. All of these are called isotopes of carbon because they are all carbon, but they have different numbers of neutrons and different masses. So isotopes are what we're learning about today and make sure you understand that. Now, carbon has all these isotopes that exist on the earth, but they don't exist in the same abundance. In fact, if you were to reach out and grab a hundred carbon atoms, if you were able to like grab them out of the air, we would see that of all the atoms that you have, about 98 of them or almost 99 of those carbons would be carbon-12. So most atoms are carbon-12, which is the one you see on the periodic table. However, some of them, about one of them would be carbon-13 and a little bit less than one would be carbon-14. So all of these isotopes exist, but they don't exist in the same quantities or amounts. It's like if you were to get a bag of package of Skittles, most of them would be the red Skittles and maybe one of them would be the yellow Skittles and you might get like, possibly per chance, you might get one of the purple Skittles over here. So those numbers are important because they represent the average atomic mass. When we look on the periodic table, for example, right here with carbon, we see that carbon is represented by 12.01. Why didn't they just write carbon with a mass of 12? If that represents the protons and the neutrons, why isn't it a whole number? Because protons and neutrons come in whole numbers. Well, the reason for that is because this number does not represent one of the carbons. It represents all of the carbon isotopes, for, namely carbon 12, carbon 13, and carbon 14. But you're like, hey, T-Pop, if you take 12 plus 13 plus 14, add them all together and then divide by three, the average is 13, not 12.01. And you're absolutely right. But remember, the average atomic mass on the periodic table does not represent just a general average. It represents an a weighted or abundant average. Remember we talked about how carbon-12 was the most abundant? Well, that has more effect on the average weight than all the others. So notice that this number right here is more close to carbon 12 or the mass of 12 than it is to 13 or 14. But it's still a decimal place because we have to include the other masses as well, even though they're less abundant. All right, so the last thing I'm gonna talk about is isotope notation. You'll see these elements listed, or we'll talk about these elements, and we wanna write them down so we know which element we're talking about, whether that be aluminum 29 or aluminum 27 or aluminum 26. There's lots of aluminum, so we need to be able to write down them and understand what we're saying. So here's the isotope symbol for aluminum. Now, normal aluminum on the periodic table, if you look at it, aluminum normally has a mass of 27. So this is not the mass you see on the periodic table. It's not the most abundant. It is just an isotope of aluminum. But this 29 right there represents the mass of that isotope. And so we can write it like this. So aluminum, if we write this mass in the upper left hand corner, that's how we'll represent the symbol. Or we can do it a different way. We can write out the name dash 29, but both of these represents the aluminum isotope or the mass. Now remember, aluminum has a, has a number of protons is 13, so the rest of those is going to be the number of neutrons. All right, so here's a little bit of a practice. How many of each subatomic particles does fluorine 21 have? I recommend that you pause the video and see if you can answer this question, but I'm going to go ahead and go through it. Did you pause and try? Great, let's try it out. All right, fluorine 21. I can write fluorine 21 like this, fluorine 21, or I can write it as an isotope symbol like this. But fluorine 21 has nine protons, 12 neutrons, and nine electrons. Nine protons because I look on the periodic table, 12 neutrons because I take that mass of 21 and minus the protons, and then finally nine electrons because they cancel out those protons. Here's the last problem. Determine the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons of these two isotopes of nitrogen. Pause the video. Did you get it? Great. Here are the answers. 
good luck guys try the practice and let me know if you have any questions